form of professional advancement. What's at stake? Not that much. But as we know, the smaller the stakes, the more vicious the fight. Among the prizes are better titles, higher salaries, the ability to get the best possible teaching times, and to reduce, reduce one's teaching load in office hours, preferably to zero. To advance one's favorite people, to get a larger office with a puffier chair, to know all the right people in the profession, and best of all, to lord it over others. Being able to reduce the influence of your enemies and increase the influence of your friends in a way that causes people to become your lifelong minions and supplicants. In politics, there, is, there are even more prizes. To be close to politicians, to get outside gigs in which you serve as an expert in drafting legislation or in legal proceedings, to testify before Congress, to get called by the media to comment on national affairs and the like. The point is not to advance ideas, but rather to advance oneself in a professional sense. Outsiders imagine that the life of a university is all about ideas. But insiders know that often the real battles that take place within de departments have little to do with ideas or principles. Strange coalitions can develop based entirely on the pettiest of issues. Professional ambitions are the driving force, not principles. There are people in every department who are highly accomplished, but whose accomplishments have nothing to do with science, teaching truth, or pursuing a vocation as a real scholar. This, of course, has been the case for many centuries, maybe forever in academia. Petty pursuits are often rewarded in this life, while those who eschew them in favor of truth are often pushed aside and relegated to a permanently low status. This is just part of the facts of life. This is what Hayek was referring to. It's what Mises' life illustrates perfectly. But let's return to Professor Meyer. The main energies of Meyer were spent on open war with his rival for power, Otmar Spahn. This consumed him almost completely. He believed that he had to keep Spahn at bay in order to advance himself. Meyer attacked Spahn in every possible place and way and brought scandal to the department with his war to the knife. Note here that Meyer and Spahn did not disagree on any matter of policy in any substantive way. It was all about position and power. When he wasn't consumed with a passionate hatred for and plots against Spahn, Meyer spent the remainder of his energy building up his power base within the university. It began well for him as the acknowledged successor to Friedrich von Wieser, who had been the previous power broker. Meyer had established himself as the most groveling student of Wieser's. His reward was that Wieser named him as his successor by passing not only Mises, but also the remarkable Joseph Schumpeter. Then began Meyer's march. He called the shots. Mises himself, of course, was on his enemies list. Meyer was in part responsible for denying Mises a full-time teaching position and salary at the university. But that wasn't enough for him. He treated Mises' students very badly during examinations and otherwise. And for this reason, Mises even went so far as to suggest that his seminar participants decline to be officially registered to prevent them from being harmed by Meyer. As a result, only 20% of Mises' students were officially registered. Meyer also worked to make it nearly impossible for any student in the department to write a dissertation under Mises. The politics were vicious and relentless. What was Mises' attitude? He writes in his memoir, quote, I could not be bothered by any of these things, unquote. He just kept on doing his work. One can easily imagine scenes from this period. Mises is in his office, writing and reading, trying to hammer out and perfect theory of the business cycle or reflect on the problem of economic methodology. A student might come in and let him know about Meyer's latest antics. He might look up from his work, sigh with exasperation, and tell the student not to worry about it, and then go back to work. He refused to be drawn in. The Mises Circle was aghast by the goings-on, but the members did their best to make light of it all. They even made up a song set to a traditional uh, Viennese melody called the Meyer-Mises Debate. It featured the two economists talking past each other and sharing no common values whatsoever. At one point, Mises' Circle grew into a full-blown economic society associated with the university. 
Mises, however, could only be vice president. Meyer had to be president since he was the master of the universe as far as economics in Vienna was concerned. Meyer never missed a chance to underscore who he was and what he could do. Mises' position as vice president would not last. The time came when Nazism grew in influence in Austria. As an old-time liberal and as a Jew, Mises knew that his time was limited. Sensing the possibility of even physical harm, Mises accepted a new position in Geneva and left his, for his new home in 1934. The society declined in membership and otherwise floundered. In 1938, Austria was annexed to the German Third Reich. Meyer had a choice about what he would do. He could have stood by principle, but why would he do that? That would have meant sacrificing his self-interest for the greater good, and that is something Meyer had never done. Quite the opposite, his entire academic career was about Meyer and Meyer alone. So to his everlasting disgrace, he wrote all the members of the Economic Society. The announcement was that all non-Aryan members were hereby expelled. This meant, of course, that no Jews were allowed. He cited, quote, the changed circumstances in German Austria and in view of the respective laws now applicable to this state, unquote. So you can see then that Meyer's alleged power over his underlings was bested by the greater power of the state to which he was unfailingly loyal. He thrived before the Nazis. He thrived during the Nazis. He helped the Nazis purge the Jews and the liberals. Note that Meyer was no raging anti-Semite himself. His decision was a result of a series of discrete choices for position and power in the profession against truth and principle. One day it seemed harmless in some way. And then the moment of truth arrived in which he played a role in the mass slaughter of ideas and those who held them. Perhaps Meyer thought he had made the right choice. After all, he maintained his privileges and perks. And after the war, when the communists came and took over the department, he thrived then too. He did all that an academic was supposed to do to get ahead, and he achieved all the glory an academic can expect to achieve, regardless of the circumstances. But consider the irony of all this supposed power and glory. In the bigger picture of continental economics in general, the Austrians were not highly regarded by the profession at large. Since the turn of the century, the German historical school had captured the mantle of science. Their empirical orientation and stance against classical theory had over the decades melded nicely with the rise of positivism in the social sciences. Never forget that the phrase Austrian school was coined not by the Austrians, but by the German historical school. And the phrase was used as a put-down, with overtones of a school mired in scholasticism and medieval deduction rather than real science. So our friend Meyer thought that he was master of the universe, but he was in fact more like Yertle the turtle, a pushy terrapin in a very small pond. He played the game, and that was all he did. He thought he won too, but history has rendered a different judgment. He died in 1955, and then what happened? Well, justice finally arrived. He was instantly forgotten. Of all the students he had during his life, he had none after his death. There were no Meyerians. Hayek reflected on this amazing development. He expected much to come out of the Wieser Meyer school, he said, and not much out of the Mises branch. He writes that the very opposite happened. Meyer's machine seemed promising, but it broke down completely, while Mises had no machine at all, and yet became the leader of a global colossus of ideas. If we look at Mark Blaug's book, Who's Who in Economics, a 1,300-page tome, there was an entry from Menger, Hayek, von Bavarek, and, of course, Ludwig von Mises. The entry calls Mises, quote, the leading 20th century figure of the Austrian school and credits him with contributions to methodology, price theory, business psychotheory, monetary theory, socialist theory, and interventionism. There was no mention of the price he paid in life, no mention of his courageous moral choices, no mention of the grim reality of a life moving from country to country to stay ahead of the state. He ended up being known only for his triumphs, about which perhaps not even Mises was aware during his own life. And guess what? There is no entry at all in this book for Hans Meyer. 
It is not that his status is reduced, not that he is noted and dismissed, not that he is put down as a minor thinker with enormous power. He is not called a Nazi collaborator or a communist collaborator, not at all. He isn't even mentioned. It's as if he never existed. Meyer's legacy vanished so fast after his death, he was forgotten a few years later. As Oscar Wilde might have said, the only thing worse than being spoken ill of after one's death is not to be spoken of at all. It is so bad for Meyer today that Wikipedia doesn't even have an entry for him. 